Even though you and I genetically can't have a child without a lot of planning and foresight and We've all of that. We've been trying, <laughs> but <laughs> Try it's just, we may. just won't take. <laughs> what would I do if I was out there with two babies? And two babies. Let's not get out of hand here. <laughs> Sorry, three. Our portfolio was presented to a birth mother and we were selected. <laughs> like, finally, we got picked, but it, it, we were no longer there. Good morning and welcome back to another episode of Tangents with Tyler and Todd. I'm your host, Tyler. And I'm Todd. So, how was your week? It was very interesting. Yeah. Um, Not the week at all that I thought that we were going to have. Are we ready to talk about where we were this morning? Hi. Hi, Eddie. (laughs) We literally just turned on the camera. (laughs) For those of you who are listening on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts, our golden retriever, Eddie, is... I would say pretty desperate, desperate dog, desperate for attention constantly. He's needy. Needy. You are a needy boy, but we love you. Come on up. And he's somehow uh. gotten to know that whenever the camera turns on, he's going to be able to cuddle up there we with go. his dads. All right. Hey. Have a good nap. <laughs> We're just going to chit chat. We're just going to chat. Okay. You, you have a little oh. nap. So yeah. Where were we this morning? So we had a doctor's appointment um, because we need to do a sperm analysis. Yeah. So this kind of leads nicely into today's <laughs> topic of what do we think about kids? Are they in our future? Do we want them? Well, there's a bit of a history to it. Yeah. And I feel as though our opinions have changed over time. So before we get to our sperm analysis, we figured we'd go back to the beginning and sort of walk you through what led us to this morning. Yeah. So as you know, um, we've been together for 15 years and married for 10. It'll be 10 years next year. So nine. (laughs) (laughs) But like, Like, I'll be 50 in 17 (laughs) years, but I still just say 33. Do you remember that (laughs) A guy that was on TV and and he was like, and if it was, oh oh my, what was it? She was like, oh, it's almost like a, a bolognese or whatever. And he's like, yeah, and if my grandma had wheels, she'd be a bike. <laughs> so anyway, we will be celebrating our tenth wedding anniversary next summer. So we've been married for nine years. Yeah. And throughout this time together, like the fourteen years total, when we first got together, we didn't want kids. A family wasn't really something that we ever saw in our future. It was actually something that we actively didn't want. And yeah. we've really ebbed and flowed throughout, I guess, that experience. I always thought that I would be dead set on I want to have a kid or I don't want to have a kid. And there's been periods where I felt all of it completely against, didn't care either way, and then completely for which yeah. is weird it, and I think that's kind of normal I think it's yeah. a natural process to kind of ebb and flow through that especially because there were times where things were going really well for us with our careers and we didn't want to let up the gas on that mm-hmm. to have a family because we knew that the time if like what we were working towards if it worked out we would have all kinds of time to have kids and like really focus a hundred percent on being the best dads we could yeah it's it's always been like a tricky topic for me because it's something that you constantly get asked as you get older like especially once you get married yeah people like, ask it a lot a lot which i think is also something that needs to be like gotten rid of because you don't know someone's struggle of yeah. like what they're going through behind closed doors to start a family. And then also, if they don't want to have kids, this is the other thing. When we would say we don't want to have kids, there were people that would then try and talk us into it. But like, it it's, it's a really interesting topic, I think, because no matter what, when you say whether you want kids or don't want kids, people do people inevitably judge you. I know for a fact right now, there are people that are listening that are probably shocked or like, why do they want kids? I would never want kids in today's day and age. Like it, it really like you, it snowballs so quickly. And we've seen both ends of the spectrum from wanting to have kids and then not wanting to have kids. And it's a lot of pressure. Yeah. So I would say, around when we got married, things started 
to change. And I don't know if that's just because people were asking us if we wanted to have kids next or if it was because we had the house and it just like you're programmed that that's the next step. Like the checking boxes thing you've spoken about before. Exactly. And so I think what happened was we just really started like we went extreme into it as well. So we were on the adoption wait list. Like we went through that whole experience, which I'm really thankful that we did. It was very eye opening and also huge for our marriage. What so backing up a bit, what what made you initially decide, yes, I do want to start a family? What did that look like? It was So we went back and forth between surrogacy and adoption, and we settled on adoption um, just because that was the point in our life that we were at, and we felt that we could give a child a good home. That, I think, was a big thing, but also the fact that when we got married and committed like the rest of our lives together until we either get divorced. But you know what I mean? Like, we took that next step. Such a romantic. (laughs) A realist. But... I wanted to have something that went past you and I that had both of the traits that we have come to love in each other. Um, And I I thought that there's really cool things that you could instill in a child and teach a child and provide to a child. And I thought the same for what I could do. Yeah, I I agree. Like, I don't think that when in starting a family my priorities, it really wasn't rooted in needing to see me in another child in terms of like physicality. But there's something really special about rate the thought of raising a child with you, regardless of if, if it's genetically ours, but instilling our values and the things that are important to us in that child. I just I know that you would be such a good dad. I think you'd be a pretty cool dad, too. I think we both would be. I just think that we'd be the hot dad on the block. (laughs) I mean, we have no neighbors. What would you be? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) The hot dads. I feel like the gays are always the ones that the moms, like, look at, you know, in the shows when they drop the kids off. Yeah, it's such a stereotype. Such a stereotype. But anyway, like, it really, that, I think, was what made it pretty easy for me to decide, you know what, I'm ready to to pursue that and adoption to me made the most sense because it seemed like the easiest path at the time but what we didn't know before going through that process was how incredibly time consuming it actually is and the training that you have to go through and the assessments with social workers and the legality of it all we officially got approved for everything after about nine months of work. Yeah, so it was a really cool experience, and I'm very thankful that we went through it. Incredibly grateful for that experience. Yeah, so the way it starts out is a three-day course with all the other couples that are looking to go through the adoption process. It was really hard to sit in that room, being the only same-sex couple, and listening to all these other couples talk about the years and years and years and treatments and money and the mental toll, everything that they had gone through to try and have a child. It was heartbreaking to hear. Yeah, it and was... It, was, it was the first time that I felt like I had never been in a situation where there was so much compassion and just like quickly all mm-hmm. these adult strangers became like really close yeah. and it was a very intimate experience it was really it was sad and tragic but beautiful in a way because seeing everyone sharing their stories so openly it gave us a lot of perspective too because even though you and I genetically can't have a child without a lot of planning and foresight and all we've been that. trying but <laughs> Try as we may. Just won't take. (laughs) (laughs) But it's it's a different layer. And seeing these women and hearing their stories of infertility, it just, it was really eye-opening and put a lot of, not that I didn't value the process before, but it, it was a really important element, I guess, of it. It also gave me a lot of hope because those 
couples are going to be the best parents oh, yeah. out there because they are going to love whatever child they eventually, hopefully they've all been placed with someone now, but the love that they would give. Yeah. So anyway, that was the first part of the journey, which was really cool. So once you go through that, then you start the home assessments. This is where we get really thankful. This was more of an exercise in marriage and compatibility, I feel. So if everyone had to go through this sort of an assessment before having a kid, I just can't before even getting married. Yeah, I just the world would be such such a better place. It just made sure we were aligned with where we were going and what we wanted out of having a child. So basically how it worked was we each met with a social worker independently for I think like three hours. It was quite a long time. And they'd ask you everything that you can think of from how you would discipline a kid in a certain situation to how do you plan on being a parent when you have a kid in high school and they do something really reckless? Like any situation you can imagine, they would ask you And you had to be honest. And Todd wasn't there with me. So it was true how I would want to parent. And then Todd had the exact same thing done. And to be able to meet in the middle on like how you were, how we would parent differently. And it was also really interesting because there were questions that I would be asked and I would give my answer. And then Tyler would be asked and he would give his answer. And then we would have to answer the question for the other person to make sure that we were like on the same page or the answers were truthful. It was a really cool experience. So we went through that twice. There were two Mm -hmm. of those individual assessments plus two in-home assessments, which I just, there's so much that I liked about it because maybe it's just the way you and I are, but the conversations that we had before these sessions would be making sure we were like, okay, so Johnny comes home with an F on a report card. What are you going to do? Kind of talking about all that stuff. But it would spiral off into more of just like a values conversation or a life conversation. And it just, I think that really helped you and I get close. Plus we were on the other side of the country with no family or friends. So we had a lot of time together to just Mm -hmm. kind of talk these things through. And go on very many tangents along the way. Exactly. But yeah, that that was a really important experience for us. But it was also very invasive because in addition to completely exposing yourself personally, you're also exposing yourself financially, professionally. Legally. Le- like- ev- there And with good reason, you are having the potential to be given a child to raise as your own, it is imperative that that child has a safe, secure home that they're going to be loved unconditionally. So that's why all that due diligence takes place. So once that finally happened, we got on the waiting list. and But we had to, once we were approved, before you go on the wait list, you had to figure out what you wanted. So there were different options. We could do a closed adoption. We could do an open adoption. If we did open it, which I guess, so the basic, the difference between them is open is um, the record's not sealed. So the birth parents. Which is much more common nowadays. Yeah. And that's what we were going with. But basically the birth parents, it's a pre-negotiated amount of exposure to the child and a relationship. And we felt it was important to maintain that if the birth parents wanted it because of the genetic health of the child. So if they needed bone marrow, a kidney, like all these different things, we had a better shot of like... Also the psychological impact. Like this was the other thing during the adoption training was mothers of birth mothers of children would come in and share their experience. And let me tell you... That was so profound. Do you remember that woman? I remember what they said. Um, They told us to always remember that someone's going into the hospital with a baby and someone's going in without a baby and it flips and that person that went in with the baby comes home without it and the people that didn't have it come home with it. And it was really like a hard thing to kind of wrap our heads around just how hard that moment was going to be. And even because the thing is, Even when someone gives a child up for adoption, even if it's the absolute best thing that that child could ever, could ever happen to them, 
it still doesn't diminish that how difficult and complex emotionally that is for the birth mother and sh- hearing so many different stories from different birth parents like it just that for us was why we needed to have an open adoption and th- why clothes just wasn't an option for us so mm-hmm. throughout that process we really got to pick another option was an instant placement so what that meant was you could get a call and in a few hours you'd have to be at the hospital to pick up the baby and like you'd have to have a car seat ready you had to have diapers you had to have like the basic essentials in it, order to be eligible for that and we we were fine with that yeah but it also meant that instantly one of us was going to be on a parental leave and our income was going like one of our um salaries was going to be gone yeah i made less money than tyler so i was going to take the bulk of the leave so that it was less of a financial burden but we had been preparing for this so Tyler got really into the flyers and he would there was a store in Canada it's called Shoppers Drug Mart and he would watch their flyers to get their optimum points and he would get the diapers as they went on sale but not just any diapers Tyler went through and did Hold research on one second I spreadsheets I stacked the the optimum points that you'd get from shoppers with the manufacturer's coupons and if you bought the small packs when they were on like the two for whatever, $18, you could basically get them for free. I would have to pay a little bit of money at the at the checkout, but the value of the points on the back end that we could use for groceries. Oh. So it was like a wash. Like I was getting those diapers for free. That's why we had over a thousand diapers. Girl math. <laughs> <laughs> but Tyler... <laughs> Tyler had gone through and done research about what the average baby, how many diapers of each size you need. And we were working towards having as much of that ahead of time as we could. I was all in. To soften the blow. We were watching the used furniture sites and getting like baby toys. And we had a crib. We just had to get the mattress. All these things we were preparing for because we never knew if today was the day we were getting that phone call. I don't think we've ever really talked about how hard that two years was to really plan anything. But at it, the same time, we were busy planning. Yeah, it I think was a it's it is difficult to like look back and feel those emotions because it I don't know how to explain it properly. It just felt like everything was on hold, I guess. We wanted to have a child so badly and it could happen at any moment, but we didn't know what moment it would happen. And so many people would get picked before us because it's all subjective. It's the it's the birth mother seeing a basically a portfolio of us based on all of those meetings, all of our training that we've done, the letter that we wrote, basically a full biography of who we are. And someone had to pick that. And I guess we yeah. should also say we were going through a different, we were going through an um, organization for the adoption. So it wasn't like through child services, it was through a charity group. So that's why there was a, we're talking about the birth mother a lot because this adoption type was a mother for whatever reason couldn't keep the baby but didn't want to have an abortion. So then once the baby was born, everything was predetermined ahead of time. So the mother had all kinds of time to figure out the who they felt best to take care of the child, that you would meet with them. It was a whole process, kind of like a courtship, really. So just in case people are confused yeah. a- about it. It wasn't the government selecting us. It was the individual person. Yeah, yeah. So that's why it was also hard because it's like, am I not good enough? Like, mm-hmm. what? why is if I'm at place 80 on the list, which really doesn't matter because it does come down to fit, but there was a list and we were, say you were 80 and 87 got picked before you. Well, like, what did they have that I don't? You could call in every Friday and get an update of where you were on the list. And that was a thing that kind of consumed us for a while because it was just something that we wanted so bad. And then... Yeah. And there was nothing you could do to change it. There, And that's what 
was really hard was we had to just allow fate to do its thing, which is something like we we like to give fate a little bit of a Red Bull and a like a little push nudge. in the right direction <laughs> yeah. to like keep things moving. But there was nothing we could do. It no. was literally out of our hands. And it's a very helpless feeling because when we say it was hard to plan, it was hard to really make big commitments. But at the same time, we were trying to live our life as normal and also keep building our business so that we would be in a more stable place whenever it happens. It was a very weird time. And I remember ebbing and flowing through the highs and the lows. But for some reason, and I don't know why, when I was high, you were low. And when you were high, I was low. Mm -hmm. And it was really good because it would have been a dark place if we both went low. I think that this is probably true of anyone that is starting a family. It it is it's an incredibly emotional time. The roller coasters, like the peaks and the valleys of it all. Um, yeah, there were there were some dark days, but you're right. Like we were never there together. We were always like lifting each other up and like encouraging one another. But what was it that made you decide to not be on the adoption list anymore? How did that? come to be two years after spending so much time and energy and really wanting this. Yeah. I I don't know. Even to this day, I don't know what it is other than like when your gut tells you something, you have to listen to it. I remember where we were. We had just finished because every year you had to go through a renewal um, to maintain your place on the list just to make sure that you still both had jobs, you both were married, you're like, everything was still checking out so that the portfolio that the birth parents were looking at was still an accurate reflection of the home. Makes sense. Totally. So I remember we had just gone through our third one of it. So it was placing us on for a third year. And we passed a month went by, maybe not even. And I remember you and I sitting out in the backyard having a bonfire. Mm -hmm. And I don't know who said it first, but someone said, how serious do we still, are we still about having kids? And it was so interesting because it was honestly like, I don't know. You and I were probably up till three in the morning just chatting because it it was as if a floodgate of everything that we'd been holding back. And it turns out that for probably about three, four months, both of us had been feeling, I don't think this is the time anymore. Mm -hmm. But we didn't know how to say it to the other one because of everything we had gone through, which is interesting because if we had have had a child at when we first started, that was the time then, but that moment passed and it wasn't the time Mm -hmm. when we were sitting by the fire that night. Yeah. And it's a really complicated and like kind of nuanced decision to come to because we did want it. And in that moment, part of us still wanted it. But we wanted to focus on our careers, we wanted to take chances, we would have never been able to leave our jobs, move into an RV, and hit the road. This whole entire life that we've created here, I personally do not think that we would have been able to accomplish what we had if we had a kid at that time. And we went through this really tricky period where when we decided to come off the adoption list, that meant we don't ever want a kid again. We said we are never, ever, ever having kids. We went extreme. Extreme, extreme on the, on the other end. Looking back, I think that was a coping mechanism because in my mind, 100% was, I know we were saying that, but in my mind, I also kind of knew like I had to work through, I wasn't, I felt like I was, we were perceived as selfish or something for like not wanting to have kids. Like there's always this pressure when you Mm -hmm. say you don't want to have kids that people feel a certain way about it. And I had to like keep telling myself, I'm not selfish, I'm self-aware because I knew that my heart wasn't 100% in having a child at that moment. And I couldn't say with 100% certainty that if we had a child at that time and it 
meant that the ripple effect meant that what we were striving to build for all those years mm-hmm. was no longer attainable. I can't say that I would be 100% happy at the end of my life. And I couldn't raise a child with, with the re- that. With the potential of resentment. A hundred percent. And not that I would resent the child. I would love it, but it's the what if. Yeah. And like, I think it was just too big of a what if to risk. I mean, I, I agree with you 100%. I, here's my thing. Even though I want to have a child with you now, well, I've always wanted to, I have never felt as passionate about it as you are. And I think that that's normal. Your mom has said this to me before that if she didn't, if she hadn't met your dad, she probably wouldn't have had kids because he so passionately wanted them. It doesn't mean that your mom doesn't love you and love your brother, but it, she probably loves me more though. <laughs> Just going to throw that out there because he doesn't coming. have a podcast to defend himself. <laughs> <laughs> but not to, not to speak for her, but I just think everyone, everyone's opinion on children are different. And just because you, you really, really want kids. I want kids because you want kids so much that I, I could go, I could have kids. I could not have kids and I would be okay with either, but I'm, I'm not saying that I'm doing it for you, but do you know what I'm a hundred percent? So okay. recently, okay. So I'm going to come right back to this. I'm just going to wrap up the adoption thing and then we'll come back up here. Okay. So we made the decision to come off the list and that was it. We then focused on our jobs. We got to a place that we felt comfortable that we could take a leap of faith and we quit them and we started traveling and something really bad happened though. Yeah. We should talk about that. So with it, there was a glitch and I I remember where we were. We removed ourselves from the list. And so we've already talked about how it, the birth mother selects a profile and it's a very hard thing. This person is finding someone else to raise their baby. It's a, there's no, when you, when you make the decision to come off the adoption list, it is a really, really big deal with the agency. There's a lot of conversation that happens to make 100% sure because if something happens that a birth mother selects you and then you say no, that's heartbreaking because they're to look at somebody else as like a runner up is almost impossible to do because yeah. that that birth mother once they see you and get to know your profile they're like creating plans for what the life that their child could have it yeah it was hard we were back here <laughs> God, every so episode. I'm, every episode. Why can't we choose? Like, why <laughs> I, don't we? I know I shouldn't have brought it up, but like, I want to be honest about. I want to be honest about the experience. So anyway, we were back here visiting family, and my brother was getting married, and the system glitched, and for some reason, our portfolio was presented to a birth mother, and we were selected, and it was really hard and shitty to be put in that position. To have to be the one to tell, like, to say no. It was a really, really hard thing. And it still stays with me today because it took a long time to get over. Like, this person finally, like, finally, we got picked. But we were no longer there. Mm -hmm. And, like, it, it, it just, it was crushing because I can I can't even imagine how that mother must have felt. Like already she would have been in such a state of turmoil to then have to go through it again and like feel as though you're and not that we were the best and like second best, but it it was in her opinion. Yeah. We were the best choice and she had to go with the second best. And I mean I think about that often and I, I, I feel bad because it's something that like we'll never be able to like get rid of like what could have been. It's another yeah. what could have been. Yeah. I, I think that that was why it was so hard. It wasn't so much that 
we were second guessing our decision because we we knew when we got the call that it's not like we were going to say oh actually yeah oh, we'll we'll take the baby like we knew we knew that it that we were making the right decision what was so heartbreaking was the fact that when a match happens <clears throat> it's so it's it's so perfect always because of how much time is put into it and saying no was it it's something we'll always think about of what that could have been especially now that we're in a place in our life where we do want kids again that like we it's, would it's the what if of it and yeah. knowing how devastating that would have been for her but then not being able to like talk to her or say like explain i don't that's what i don't know what story got told to her because yeah, I don't know. we told the agency like and they were so mortified that it happened like, it's a big deal for something like that to happen and they were yeah like they were they handled it well but that's also why we went with this group you gotta wipe your face <laughs> like you <laughs> it was um a charitable organization so we had to pay to go through this process. I think it was like $10,000 or something to go through all of this because the social workers need to get paid for like their salaries and all of that. But all the money, instead of it being for profit, it sits in a pool and all that money is saved to cover the cost of therapy and counseling for children that are adopted through the agency as well as the birth parents in case they need help coming to terms with it as well and it's valid for as long as the birth parents and the child are alive so i take some solace in the fact that like yeah. at, i hope she took advantage of that and we contributed to that with like whatever they didn't use for staffing i, I that's how i've come to peace with it but it, it's it's it was still, a hard one. It it was a hard one, and it's still obviously something that we think a lot about. But we've are. Could you imagine having a five year old right now? No. Wow. Like we got a lot on the go here. Oh, a lot. So now that we've got the whole adoption story out of the way, it takes us back <laughs> to the conversation we had a couple weeks ago, where we were talking about we've recently realized that we do want a family. We're in a place now where I have the life I want and there's nothing I, I'm i trying to hide, change, run from, anything like that. And I feel like I'm in a place where I can give 100% of myself to a child. And I know that you struggle with that. So we had a really cool conversation a couple weeks ago. Every morning we go for our little power walks and... <laughs> We were our gay asses <laughs> ripping up the trail with our rubber boots, steel-toed rubber boots. Yeah, we yeah, it's Dunlop season we call it and we <laughs> go with our coffees and our big rubber boots. But you really opened up to me about your fear of not being able to parent to the same level that like we think I can. But that <laughs> that we that we know you can. But it's also like that's not your strength. You're not really a people person. You love work. You're always always like trying to figure out the next thing or you like that type of challenge where I am more of a people person. I like teaching. I like learning. I like all those sorts of things. Not not that I'm like a hundred percent one way and you're a hundred percent the exactly. other, but definitely we these both, are strong. These, yeah, we both lean into that more. And it was really cool that you opened up to me about how you're worried you won't be able to keep up with me as a parent. And we had a conversation about how I think that that's normal yeah. that like one parent kind of has to take the lead on that and a parent needs to, the other takes the lead on something else. And I think that's kind of like how we run our household. Like there are things that I am the lead on Oh yeah, and you support me and there are things that you take the lead on and I support you. But like, I think that you get into a lot of conflict when you're both trying to parent because no matter how much we talk about it when the actual day comes and we're parenting I think for us to be 100% on the same page 100% of the time isn't realistic it's it's completely unrealistic and not only that but that's true of anything in life whether it's dishes whether it's going grocery shopping I hate grocery shopping love grocery shopping 
hate dishes. Yeah, works out. Well, you don't love dishes, but... I don't really, but I make it work. It's it's the price you have to pay. <laughs> exactly. But the point being is, out of 100, maybe I do 80, 20 sometimes. Maybe you do 85 and I do 15. Like, we we are really at the end of the day on the same team and we've always approached life that way yeah. like we we balance each other out and opening up to you about the parenting side of it my anxiety came from i'm not going to be able to be as present as you or be as active as you but there are times where I'm going to be more. It's just I don't I didn't believe that I could be the primary caretaker, I guess. 100%. And I want to be clear. This this isn't me saying that Todd's going to take care of the our child 80% of the time and I'm going to be off working and like that's not no, that's not what we're saying. But it's like when it comes to like discipline and setting the rules and like I'm going to be the cool dad. But like, who's the point of contact if there's an issue at school? Like, it's going to like come to me and I filter it to you as needed. And yeah. I think it's really noble that parents try and make everything 50-50 and like whatever. But I don't know how practical that is in real life because every other facet of our life, it is not 50-50. Mm-mm. Like, that's what, I w- that's what I'm trying to say. Like, but, it's... So... It's exactly that. And there's times where if, say, I'm the lead on something and I'm just having one of those days, I can't do it. I just look at you or even say if it's to you. you like, even if it's your thing. It's like, I need you to just run with this. On it. Don't well, worry. What is it? Um, Brene um, Brown, her thing, like when I'm at a 30, I need you to pick up the extra, you know? No. Um, She said... It's something about how, like, in relationships, it's 50-50, but there's times where someone might be at a 20 and you have to pick up that extra 30 to keep it going. And I feel like that's kind of true. Like, there are times where I just need you to take the extra weight, put in the extra work. Yeah. Like, just do the friggin' dishes. (laughs) I'll do them, but I won't be happy about it. (laughs) That's how I feel about grocery shopping. Often I say, can I just sit in the car? There is nothing I love more than just going and looking at, reading all the labels and just seeing, seeing what it's all about. It drives me crazy. He will spend five minutes, like, comparing the pennies per ounce of beans. I get that, honestly. You wouldn't believe my mom. Oh, my God. Yeah. Meanwhile, I go in for, like, I go in for, I can't grocery shop. I go in, I get bag of chips bag of salad, bag of peppermints, and a case of Sprite or bubbly. And then I'm like, I've got supper. And you you forget like everything that you actually went to the store for. Yeah, I just, it's more so like just going to get some snacks for me. (laughs) Anyway, tangent. Yeah. So all this is to say, we have made the decision that we are open to parenting again. And we haven't made up our minds exactly what that looks like. We're open to adoption, but we've actually opened our mind to the surrogacy process, which yeah. brings us back to what opened this conversation, semen analysis. Yeah. So it's been um, kind of a conflicting journey to get here. I think on the, the surrogacy side of things, the reason it's a little bit more appealing right now than the adoption process that we went through before is it's a bit less invasive from like a personal standpoint and like all of the training and all of the things that we had to do previously. I don't know, just to be honest, I don't know that I would want to open myself up to that. And yeah, that's kind of just like where I'm at with it. For me, it's timelines. When we look at the typical length of adoption because adoption rates are going down because there's not as many children up for adoption and so when we look at the timelines like I don't know like everyone has their own journey and their own path but I don't want to be starting my parent journey in my 40s I want to be entering my 40s really confident with the life I have and where I'm going because like it's very important in my view to enter that strong because it sets the tone for the rest of your life. Yeah. I I think a big reason to just be really honest is the financial aspect. In 2021, a rule changed where we live that um, a lot of the expense of starting a family 
by surrogacy, even if you're an LGBTQ plus couple, is there. So you like get, that kind of makes it. It's a tax. Like you can, the amount you, I don't know how taxes work, but it's like <laughs> deductible or something. It's yeah. kind of like swimming lessons. Like when I worked at the pool, people would ask for tax receipts. Yeah, it's sort of like that, only like a lot more complicated. This is why I'm not an accountant. <laughs> yeah, but we're also like, we also have the benefit of living in Canada where this process is much not, more affordable. Yeah, it's not nearly as expensive. Which was also something we didn't realize. We had this big fear that it was the 250000 American dollar yeah. thing you see like down in the States. But it's super common. Like you, I'm sure you've seen it in like TV and stuff like... Um, it's very common in like California and like all of that. And it's literally hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's kind of nuts. Yeah. So we don't know the exact cost yet. We are looking to meet with some agencies because there is still a wait. It's yeah. obviously not an instant thing. We don't just walk in and say, can you start baking a baby for us? Yeah. There's a whole process that we need to work our ways through. and today, which, brought, which brought us to this morning. <laughs> which is the first step. In order to enter into the clinic to start the consultancy, we need to be referred from our family doctor and have a semen analysis because there's no point going through the surrogacy process if we're both shooting blanks. Like, honestly. Pew, pew. (laughs) Pew, pew. (laughs) And how would we have ever known? Yeah, exactly. So No pregnancy scares around here. Yeah, this is um, very open, but I didn't think I'd ever be talking about a semen analysis on a podcast. But you know what? I didn't either. But like, this is where we're at. Yeah, it's just it's the reality of it. And our we have quite a long journey to go. But we figured why not be at least honest and open about the process and also answer the question that People ask a lot, what do we feel? This is how we feel. We have felt a bunch of different things over the years. And we finally feel like we're ready to be the best dads that we can be. Like, I don't think there's a better time. Like, yeah, we're also getting older. Like, we're 30. I'm almost 32. You're 33. I'm trying to put my socks on in the morning. It's a sign. Yeah, I'm telling you. But (laughs) the reality is, is like this process will probably take a couple of years. Like I'm not expecting to have a kid like anytime soon. It'll probably be in two or three years. And however long it takes is how long it takes. But But it could also be a lot quicker. We don't know. And I think it's just, it's exciting. I'm really excited To also just follow this process, there's a lot more to it. I think it's going to be another shared experience that's going to bring us closer together in Mm -hmm. the end, just like the adoption. Like everything happens for a reason. A lot of things don't seem it in the moment. Like it was when you look back, it's like, wow, it's so good that that happened. Yeah. But also living here now, so close to your family and like, I don't know, like my family being able to come visit. It's just, there's something more special about that that experience rather than where we used to live out West. We were there alone. Yeah, it definitely, definitely would have been a lot harder Mm -hmm. to have kids out there. Like I think having family also is a big factor in what changed it. And the fact that, yeah, you're just, you're not alone. Like that was something I always feared was, like what happened if what would happen if something happened? What would I do if I was out there with two babies and you had a car accident on your way home from work? Or we both two babies. Let's not get out of hand here. <laughs> Sorry, three. <laughs> no, I think two is my limit. Yeah, I could I could totally do one, but I could see myself having two as well. What three- about names? Ooh. I really don't know. I think I'd have to like. I feel like I'd have Neither, to. We don't really care about that kind of stuff. Like, yeah. Like, but I also think I need to meet the baby first. Like, is it okay to have your baby for a while and not name it? Um, I think so. I guess you could change it later. It's not like they're going to remember. Yeah. But I feel like, you know how some people you're like, wow. Like some people just are a Chad. <laughs> like, what if you name your baby like Lawrence and they really should be a Chad? Well, then you change it. Exactly. So that's why, like, rather than going through the paperwork, maybe we just don't name right away and we just, like, sit, like... <laughs> you're always you're always two steps ahead. <laughs> like, let's just... <laughs> let's just get the semen analysis <laughs> and then let, let's go to the next step, okay? Fair. Fair play. But 
Yeah. It's going to be a journey. It's going to be i think it's gonna have highs and lows like everything but yeah i'm excited it's the right decision i think so anyway that's our stance on kids where we've been what we think of them and hopefully where we're going with them yeah we'll see i'm sure that wasn't the most easiest way for us to answer how we feel or have felt about kids but it's been kind of a journey to find ourselves where we are now and Mm -hmm. I think that like I'd be very curious to know if that's something that's unique to like the LGBTQ or like people that can't conceive children or if everyone kind of ebbs and flows through that we want them oh it didn't happen now maybe down the road like I would actually be really curious if it's of course something that you're all comfortable with in the comments I would love to know what people's feelings are like if you don't have kids did you always know do you regret it? Like, I just, I would love to know people's takes on it. Yeah. Cause like, then you get the people that are like, I was born to be a mom. I loved being pregnant. Like, and that could be their truth, but like, did they always want it or did they ebb and flow? Like there's I, something so insufferable. I'm sorry, but there's just something so insufferable about people like that. Yeah. Yeah. I think they need to like, like congrats. You're pregnant. You get to eat whatever you want. Cause you're eating for two. <laughs> Jealous. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that is our hot take on having kids <laughs> and all of that. But I think it's time to have some tea. What do you think? Oh, I'm ready for it. You ready? Yeah. So tea time is where you send in an anonymous story that you're either in, overheard, witnessed. We don't care if it's real, fake. Just send us the juicy deets over at tylerandtodd.com slash podcast, and we will give you our unprofessional advice on how to handle the situation. Should probably not take our advice, just to say as a disclaimer, but sometimes it is valuable. Yeah, and you keep submitting them, so we keep answering. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. You ready? Yeah. I am very happily partnered with a wonderful person I love. We've been together many years, and I wouldn't dream of betraying them. But I've recently caught feelings for an old acquaintance, and it's mutual. There is an understanding that I would never betray my partner with extracurricular activities, in quotation marks, with this person. But there are strong overtones that make this an emotional affair, where I feel like I have to sneak off to have conversations about books, music, movies, our lives, and current events so my partner doesn't overhear us. Is this unhealthy? Is it okay to admit that one life partner can't be everything in your life and you should be able to seek connections elsewhere? Is this sustainable or a distraction that could detract from our real lives? Wow. Wow. Okay. That is... I feel for you. That's hard. A tough one. But at the same time, as soon as um, it, they said that it became emotional, that's where, to me, it becomes cheating. Because we... It's, it's almost worse. We believe in monogamy. That is just what works for Herbius. us. Oh, we should dive into that yeah. one time on a podcast. But I could... I could... Believing in monogamy, I could get past if you were drunk in a bar and something... Like I could, we could yeah. work through it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But when you start sharing your emotions and feelings and the intimacy, the like when it's no longer just sex and it's connection, yeah. that's when for me it would be like I there'd be no coming back. Yeah, I uh, I agree. I think that there's a difference between sex and intimacy. Mm-hmm. They're two very different things, and I think people sometimes get them like mixed up. And I think that's also media. Like, in TV, they portray, like, hookup sex as a very intimate thing. Like, it's not like that all the time. Do you know? Like, And that's where a lot of this confusion comes from. Personally, I think an emotional affair is worse. I agree. I could get past if you hooked up with someone. This isn't a hall pass, by the way. But, like... Don't worry. (laughs) You're you're satisfied? Yeah. (laughs) Um, It just... Yeah, I... I don't know. But I it's hard. I know because like sometimes one person can't be everything for you for you for your whole life. That's where it's it's more nuanced than exactly. You know. And there's so like at the same time, you don't. No one deserves to go through life unhappy because it is short. So, but it, it's really hard to give advice because like we don't know what your partner's stance on it 
is either. Do you know what I mean? Like, it I just feel sounds for- like this part, especially sneak off to have conversations about books, music, movies, our lives, and current events. I, f- I actually really, really feel for them because it doesn't sound like they have much to talk to their partner about at all. And that, Todd, that would be so incredibly lonely. Yeah. You and I, all we do is spend time together and we never run out of things to talk about. Do yeah. you know how, sometimes, do you know how though, lucky that is, though? Yeah, but sometimes you ignore me and I just have to fill the silence with talking. That does happen sometimes. <laughs> but, like, I would give up. If I could pick one or the other to give up, I would give up our sex rather than our intimacy. Yeah. Like when we snuggle on the couch and just watch but movies and talk, like I could never give that up. Is it, I guess this is what is also like, if if there's potential to be a friendship, because it sounds like they do have a lot yeah. in common. So maybe if you can separate the sex from the friendship... There's nothing wrong with being friends with an ex. Yeah, I that's what I would. That's what I would try and do to like, give real advice. I would try and separate it and like, yeah, don't lose that friend. That sounds like a beautiful friendship. Yeah, but I bet you they want to just get it. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Best of luck to you. If you've got a situation that you need some help with, send it on over to us. I love these. They're actually kind of fun to... They are fun. I think they're also kind of like... You know when you go to a restaurant and they have those little cards with things to talk about? Yeah, yeah. I yeah. like these because I feel like they spur a little bit of a conversation and they put us into situations that we may not find ourselves in because yeah. we live alone in the woods <laughs> Yeah, with nothing to do. Well, thank you for joining us for another episode. This one was a really emotional and vulnerable one. I mean, lately they all like, have been. Opposed to... Yeah, what's new? <laughs> but... Thank you for allowing us to have this conversation so raw and um yeah, we weren't we weren't sure how we wanted to like share our family like planning and it is very new for us so be kind. Yeah. Well, until next week, have a great week and we will see you on Wednesday. Bye. Bye. Got to come in a cup. <laughs> Do not say come in a cup. If it comes up, comes up. <laughs> Y'all want to come in a cup? (laughs) 